when my blood sugar is at its top. <laughs> um, and so I'm very pleased to be here. It's my first time in Rome, my first time in Italy, and I'm having a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today about finding mechanisms. And my philosophical thesis, I know philosophers like if you have a thesis, um, is uh, the product shapes the process of discovery. And I'll say more of what I mean by that as we go. Um, and how do we go? How do we get there? Um, so here's an outline for the talk uh, for today. I'm going to just give you a, a brief summary of some of our earlier work, uh, starting in about 2000, uh, on characterizing mechanisms, various features of mechanisms, and dimensions of mechanism schemas. And the case study that I've spent a lot of time on and published in the past uh, is discovering the mechanism of protein synthesis. And that was from about 1953 to 1970. So this is the history and philosophy of science part of the talk. And my latest research, and this is the first time I've presented this material at a professional meeting. I did a bit of it for a class uh, just a few months ago. Uh, so I'll be very interested in your feedback on uh, the idea of the distinction between normal mechanisms, I'm not defining normal, which is a difficult problem as we know, uh, disease mechanisms, uh, and the idea that of trying to discover possible therapeutic sites within the mechanism. So it's, it is drug discovery, but a very tiny bit of that here. Um, so the main thing I'll be talking about is work that we're doing, that I'm doing with a computational biologist, uh, on representing disease mechanism chains. And then for this conference, I tried to do one summary slide on heuristics for mechanism chain discovery. They're kind of primitive and brief, but we'll see uh, if it connects with some of the ideas uh, here. So, uh, it, Blatant Propaganda uh, is uh, the book that Carl Craver and I recently published, uh, In Search of Mechanisms, Discoveries Across the Life Sciences. Uh, and, and there's much of the material from this early part of the talk uh, is found in that book. So my thesis, knowing what is to be discovered, if you can figure that out, which we are certainly trying to do with mechanisms, uh, guides the process of discovery. Um, and <coughs> I'll be fleshing that point out as we go. Uh, so in biology, uh, I'm claiming, uh, some of us claim, uh, that mechanism schemas play the role of theories. Uh, John Beatty very effectively argued that we don't have laws in the strong philosophical sense of law in biology. Um, and then the question is, what counts as a theory uh, in this field, uh, and what plays the role of theories, and I'll say more about the roles of explanation, prediction, control. Uh, our claim is mechanism schemas do that. Um, so, the Montgomery Darden Craver paper to, uh, published in 2000 in Philosophy of Science gave this characterization of mechanism. I'm prepared to talk in detail about every word here, 
And there's quite a bit of literature. I was just checking Google Scholar this morning. It's nearly 1,600 citations to this paper, which is astonishing to us. Um, so there's quite a literature on a lot of the aspects that may occur to you when you hear this characterization. And I can talk for hours about any of it. We spent about two years arguing over every word. Uh, but that's not the point today. I'm just going to read it for you and move on. Um, a mechanism produces a phenomenon. Mechanisms are entities and activities organized such that they are productive of regular changes from start or set up conditions to finish or termination conditions. Mechanisms have productive continuity and they're often represented as schemas in diagrams. And that was from the Mockingbird Jordan Craver paper, Plus View Science 2000. So if you were going to depict a mechanism chain in a very bare bones sort of way, this diagram shows that you have a start state. Uh, and you might say, some of you want to say, I happen to know, a st that one state causes another state. But we think of cause as a schema term, and we want it to get cashed out in terms of activities. I'm sorry, there's a bit of artifact here. I cleaned it up, but the cleaner one was too big, and it got a big mess, so I just left this. Um, so the start state, we want to have a mechanism module, that either an activity or a set of entities and activities that produce the end state. So we regard cause as a schema term that needs to be instantiated uh, with details about the activities or maybe a group of entities and activities that carries out the change. Uh, so if we think of this very, very bare bones way of representing a mechanism chain for DNA replication, the DNA replication schema, you start with one double helix. In 1953, it was a black box. Uh, and you get two identical uh, double helices at the end. And of course, Watson and Crick had some ideas about what to put into that black box. And it took about 10 years in molecular biology to work out the details of DNA replication. You start with a single double helix, you get two daughter helices. The key activity here is complementary hydrogen bonding between the bases. We now know quite a bit about the details of the enzymes and how this mechanism works, and I could expand this and give it to you in a lot more detail, but I just wanted to give you a quick example of a mechanism before I talk in more detail about the nature of mechanisms more abstractly. And I'll be giving you other examples as we go. So, if the idea is we're going to tell someone who's going to discover a mechanism what it is they're looking for, um, we say what needs to be discovered. First of all, you choose a phenomenon, a puzzling phenomenon. And that's very important in our framework for individuating what mechanism you're talking about. Then you need to figure out what the entities are, what the activities are, what the start and setup conditions are, what the finish or termination conditions are. If it's a cycle, you might just arbitrarily choose something you'll call a finish, but if it literally stops somewhere, then you have a termination condition. And you want to find productive continuity from one stage to the next, in which you know what the activities are. Um, and then you want to know how it's overall organized. It could be linear, and most of the ones I'm talking about from gene to phenotype are, but there are many cyclic ones. Bill Bechtel has been working on oscillating ones. So there can be different kinds of overall organization of mechanisms, and knowing different types can be, can be helpful at that stage. So now, in a little more detail, here's some more features of mechanisms that your, your discoverer would want to be able to specify, more or less, depending on the goals of the project. Uh, you, want to, you have to, in our view, start with the character of the phenomenon. You have to have some puzzling phenomenon you're trying to explain, trying to find the mechanism that produces it, and that immediately delimits a lot of the search space to use that kind of language. Um, then you want to know what the components of the mechanism are, the entities, the activities, 
Sometimes there are modules that are often reused, like protein synthesis and, and biological mechanisms. Uh, and you may already know details about a module that will do the change that you need, and you can just put it in without going into all the details inside the module. Now, there are spatial features of mechanisms. We're talking about mechanisms in the world. So this is a realist view to, to connect with the morning talk. Uh, we think mechanisms are in the world, uh, and our goal, uh, and, and scientists' goal, uh, the scientists' goal is often to discover those mechanisms, and our goal as a philosopher uh, of the new mechanistic philosophy of science is to say what it is that the scientist needs to discover when they are discovering the mechanism. So you may or may not need to delineate the uh, compartmentalization. Is it in the nucleus? Is it in the cytoplasm? Is it in the blood? Is it in the liver? Um, you need to, to say where, which, where different pieces of it are located. You need to have connectivity from beginning to end, ideally. Uh, you may need to know the three-dimensional structures, and I'm working with a, a protein biophysicist, and we often know in quite a lot of detail exactly what the structures are uh, and how it's oriented. So an active site is, is available or not, something that's outside the membrane or inside the membrane, orientation can be quite, quite important also. There are temporal features. Again, you may, need, may, or not, may or may not need to know about these for your given project, but there's order in which things occur rate by which they occur, they last for a certain amount of time, they're at a certain frequency, and they're contextual features. You may want to put your mechanism into a broader context of various sorts. Now I'm going to move from talking about what we think mechanisms in the world, the features they have, to the way humans represent mechanisms. Um, and those are separate chapters in the In Search of Mechanisms book. So there are various ways that, we rep that scientists represent mechanisms. You might say they're mechanistic models. Uh, we chose not to use the word model just because it has so many uses and you never know what connotations a reader is going to bring when they first see the word. Um, and for the molecular biology and neurobiology lens that Carl Craver and I primarily talk about, you often have diagrammatic schemas drawn by the scientists. So schema was a useful word for us, but if you like mechanistic model, as long as you say it's a model of a mechanism, then that language is fine with us, and it's often used in science. They're often represented in diagrams, and one I'm gonna, ones I'm going to be talking about today have diagrammatic representations. I've spent a certain amount of time trying to figure out if there's any diagram for natural selection and no one has ever done a good one. And I worked with a graphic artist and we didn't have very much success. So sometimes you can represent mechanisms and diagrams and sometimes you can't so easily. Often mathematical representations are what you need if you want to know rate, if you, know, if you can characterize something with differential equations and, and you want to, to run that for, to get rate information. Uh, or computer simulations of various kinds, quantitative or qualitative, um, and, and we, we eventually, I, I've done uh, AI representations uh, of, of qualitative mechanisms, but I'm not talking about that today. Now, there are various dimensions of mechanism schemas. We haven't published this elsewhere than in the book, so this, if you've read some of the papers, you might not have seen this list. Um, so, there are various things one can say about a mechanism schema, and you can see how this will relate to ideas about theories. Um, you may have a more or less complete schema, and that's going to be the main idea I'll talk about today, because that's a very important idea of discovery, because incompleteness indicates, ah, uh, here's a problem, that's something we need to, to finish. I'll just say briefly, uh, you can also represent schemas very abstractly or very specifically, and again, it depends on how much you know and how much you need, uh, at what degree of abstraction uh, you represent something. Um, the scope of a mechanism can be very limited, or it can be very general. Uh, there is certainly a prejudice, uh, maybe in science, but certainly among philosophers of science, of wanting to have very general laws, very general theories, generality is often considered a virtue of theories. But from the point of view of mechanisms, some of them have a very limited scope. 
One of my students worked on the mechanism by which one strain of paramecia kill another one. It's a very clever little thing that zaps out and, and kills the competitor. But it's a very narrow scope. I'll be talking a bit about protein synthesis um, and the uh, central dogma uh, in Watson's version of it uh, is almost universal in how proteins are synthesized on Earth. Uh, that's certainly not universal throughout the, the universe. Sadly, we only have one data point for life. Um, and uh, it would be great to find an alien form of life and see uh, what, what components are more general. But we never have the kind of universality of laws that philosophers often want. We never have it in biology. Now support. This is, of course, what most of 20th century philosophy of science spent their time talking about. What various of our speakers have talked about uh, is how one uh, gets uh, justification or confirmation or whatever language you use for that. Um, I use the word uh, strategies for evaluation. We've got eight or ten of those uh, for evaluating proposed mechanisms. Uh, prediction testing is only one of them. Um, and we, the goal is to move from how possibly to how plausibly to how actually. Um, and and we maybe we never get all the way to how actually, but just how most plausibly now, given the evidence now, as the, how actually might be an ideal. I'm not going to be talking about those chapters or those ideas today, uh, but if, if that's your thing as a philosopher of science, we have three chapters for you. It was supposed to be one, but Carl got a little carried away. And we had lots of ways of evaluating uh, proposed mechanism schemas. Uh, so, uh, mechanism schema versus sketch, the completeness idea, which I think is very important uh, from the point of view of uh, discovery. Um, so, a mechanism schema has placeholders for the components of the mechanisms. It has glass boxes, this is our language, we actually got it from Hansen, although he uses it slightly differently. Um, you, you, it, it means that things are telescoped and you could open it up and look inside if there's a need to know more detail of that particular step uh, of the mechanism. Um, and you can instantiate this schema with productive continuity and I'll show you an example of that with protein synthesis in just a minute. Now interestingly from the point of view of discovery is a mechanism sketch. It has black or gray boxes that indicate either an unknown module or you know the function that module carries out, but you don't yet know the structures that produce it. Uh, you don't know the entities or activities. You may need the literal structure of an entity, um, details about rate of the activity or whatever. You don't know that, uh, but you know functionally what it's going to have to do, which can certainly guide your search for things that can do that. So I worried a long time about problem finding. Um, and this is indeed one of the ways to talk about problem finding because you want to fill black and gray boxes to get continuity. Uh, and so sketches are not productively continuous. This is a very powerful, more powerful idea than I realized when I first thought of it because you can sit in a bar with scientists if they'll talk to you as a philosopher of science and say, you know, can you sketch the mechanism that you're working on? And almost all of them can take a napkin and do it. And I find I can, can for, for biology students that end up in my class, I can say, are you working in a lab? Are you trying to discover a mechanism? Come up and draw, sketch, sketch, sketch the mechanism for us and point to the black box your work deals with. And students have no trouble doing this. This is a language that's used by scientists with mechanisms. And they're used to sketching kind of what they know and what they don't know. So this is actually something that communicates very well uh, with potential interlocutors about discovering mechanisms. So another philosophical thesis. Sketches in the sense <coughs> of guides discovery. Black and gray boxes point to unknown components and indicate areas to direct additional research in a very constrained search way to fill those boxes. Um, so, um, this is a diagram from James Watson, and it had to do with DNA uh, replication, we usually say now, um, and transcription and translation. This is Watson's view of the central dogma DNA to RNA to protein, not the DNA replication part, not Crick's version. Um, and this was something that developed from about 1952 into about 1970. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and Watson claims that he put this sketch up when he was at Cambridge, before they got the double helix uh, structure, for how protein synthesis would work. And so this is the kind of thing historians love, you know, this archival sort of sketch. Uh, so this is DNA replication. DNA produces RNA. Incorrect part of the sketch, they thought at the time, whatever the messenger RNA was, it could replicate itself, the template RNA they were calling it then. Um, and that would then order the amino acids in protein. So this is one of the earliest places where all of those ideas got brought together in about 1952. Uh, and Watson replica, uh, reproduced it in the double helix in 1968. So we had to take his word for it. He actually had it in 52, but maybe he did. Uh, <coughs> you can play the role of the historian here with the archival material, but I'll try to resist that, that role today. Now, in his 1965 book, Watson literally drew a gray, gray functional um, mechanism. Uh, this is the templating module of the, how the RNA or something uh, orders the amino acid and protein. And so these are the amino acids. And their incorrect idea at that time was the there might, RNA might also, also make a helix and there might be holes that could differentiate between the 20 different amino acids. Uh, but they had the idea there was templating going on, RNA was doing it, but they didn't know exactly how. They didn't know the structure, they didn't know the activities it was carrying it out. Um, and Crick uh, did a how possibly for this idea and said they, there's not going to be enough degrees of freedom to get 20 different ways of, of 20 different uh, amino acids falling into holes. And they gave up the, the helix idea. But of course, the French, much to Crick's dismay, uh, discovered messenger RNA. And that is indeed how the templating works. Now, this is a somewhat imperfectly drawn diagram of protein synthesis. The DNA double helix is opened up by RNA polymerase. This is a very telescoped blue box here. I took a whole course once on this enzyme, fascinating enzyme. I won't, won't bother you with the details right now of how it works, to produce complementary messenger RNA, which gets transported to the cytoplasm, where the ribosome doesn't make a, a particle, dual particle, until it attaches here, so that's incorrect part of this diagram. The transfer RNA is attached to the 20 different amino acids, and that the reading of the genetic code here orders the amino acids in the protein. So this is a, a mechanism diagram uh, that has, we could, if you ask, ask a scientist today, they could put in all the features of the mechanism that I have outlined or needed to have a complete schema uh, for the mechanism, for a given protein, um, if, we, if we know the, um, well, for a given protein. Um, so that's, that's the earlier work uh, that we've done on what mechanisms are um, and how they're guiding the discovery uh, of mechanisms. So now I want to move on to the new work uh, that I'm doing now with a computational biologist who started out life as a, a physicist and became a uh, protein folding person, but now he's interested in disease mechanisms. Um, and so I'm applying the mechanism approach to medicine. I have never really considered myself a philosopher of medicine. I haven't worked much in the medical area. But mechanisms, of course, are very important in medicine, and that's what I'm doing now. So as we've argued in general, uh, knowing the mechanism is very important for explanation, sometimes for prediction, if you can get all the conditions, um, and sometimes for control. Um, so what we have typically talked about in our earlier work uh, and much of the research work in, in, theoretical, in, in pure science is understanding normal mechanisms, whatever we mean by normal. And of course, there's a range of variability, and I'm not defining that for you here. And I know the problems of doing that within philosophy of medicine. But we're already talking about disease mechanisms. We use that term. I know some of our colleagues argue against that, but that's our language. Um, and so we want to understand ways normal mechanisms fail, and we're calling them disease mechanisms. Um, and we are going to use a representation we're creating to guide the search for interventions, that is, therapies to restore normal, whatever that's taken to be in the context function. 
So our, our limited goal at the beginning of this project uh, that we've been working on for about a year now um, is to devise a digital representation for mechanism chains. We want to provide biologically informed tools to aid humans in hypothesizing disease mechanism chains. And a longer range goal is to automatically discover disease mechanism chains. Whether we'll get to that, I don't know. But that's another project with a slightly different group of people. And we're going to be trying. Uh, so, you all are now my guinea pigs. This is a good time to wake up, as I tell my classes. Um, I want you to pretend you're either a student in a human genetics class, I just had some of those, or you're a biological expert in some area um, of the, the mechanisms I'm going to be talking about. And I'm going to try to tell you, as a philosopher of biology, what we, I would like to have from you as a representation of a, a mechanism that I want you to now discover. So I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff, and I want to see if I want you, as my audience today, to tell me if I'm telling you enough that you get a pretty good idea of the product I'd like you to send back to me. We hope we'll get funding to crowdsource this to experts, but so far we're just doing it with students who are our captive audience, and I'll let you all pretend you're my captive audience today to see. Um, I'm not going to send you off to PubMed to try to find all the biology information as our students did, but I just want to see if I'm giving you enough characterization of what a mechanism chain is and what we would like to have from you. And if there are things that make no sense, uh, you tell me, because this will be useful to, to us in our, this is the cutting edge of our, of our lab's work. So, we're going to be uh, representing disease mechanisms. A disease mechanism is represented by a chain of steps connecting the beginning of the chain to the end of the chain. And we're going to be giving you single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are single base changes in a DNA uh, that we believe, that some evidence shows, are statistically associated with a change in a phenotypic expression. Um, so all of this is hy hypothesis that this connection exists. Um, and we would like you to hypothesize a possible mechanism, and then we'll go on later to talk about what kind of experimental evidence might, we might use to test these, or other statistical evidence to test these. But all we're going to be asking you to do is represent a disease mechanism chain. So this is going to be represented by a chain of steps connecting the beginning of a chain to the end, and each link between the substates shows how the perturbed state produces the next state. You can't just draw a line. It's not just nodes and lines. It's states and labeled links and states. And the label that goes on the link isn't just cause. It's certainly not just statistically associated. We're going to know that to begin with at the top level. But we want you to conjecture an activity or a known kind of module like protein synthesis, where if you just use that term, the biologist would know what you were talking about. So each link between the substate shows how the perturbed state produces the next state by a specific activity or a mechanism module, which is a group of entities and their productive activities that can give rise to the next state. So, we're going to start with genome-wide association data, that's statistical association data. And the goal is to find disease mechanisms, if there are any, still an open question, our conjecture is there are, uh, and to find the disease mechanisms. So, genome-wide association studies are being done widely now, producing data, it's part of the big data world, um, in which um, we're going to compare mutations in patients with controls. Um, so we have a rough sequence of the normal human genome, uh, or we can have actually a cohort of people uh, in, in, some, in some reference group that don't have the disease that we would compare 
uh, the, the DNA of the, those that do have the disease. And this is pretty standard technology now for getting these mutations that are found in the patients and not found uh, in the controls. Uh, so the goal is to find mutations associated with the disease um, and use GWAS data uh, to aid the disc our goal. That's not the, necessarily the GWAS people's goal. They use that, so that statistical work for other things. Our goal is to use the data to aid the discovery of disease mechanisms. And the case study that my collaborator had already chosen before I was involved in the project is Crohn's disease. It's a very messy disease of the intestine. Uh, fairly severe, it's a particularly early onset kind. Um, some of you might know the philosopher of science, Jim Bogan. He has a, a granddaughter who has it, so I get stories from the complete other end of the world of how bad it is for the little girl who's suffering from this bowel disease. Um, and and the, at this point, statistically, uh, about 100 different single nucleotide polymorphisms are statistically associated with Crohn's patients. So it's a, it's a big mess, it's a messy disease and it's a messy data set. Um, so our goal is to um, form mechanism chains with a beginning state and an end state. We're going to have perturbed intermediate states as a result of the mutation that occurred. Uh, and mechanism modules driving the changes. So, giving you the pictures now of the disease mechanism, there's a SNP that's statistically associated with the increased risk of Crohn's disease. And that's all in green, those arrows are green, this is known, the statistical associations are established, there's not any question about that. But what isn't known is the mechanism that connects them, if there is a mechanism, and what the mechanism is. And that's the black box, and we're connecting those with red arrows. So, we're going to start with a perturbed or altered state. A SNP gives rise to, typically, um, an altered messenger RNA and an altered protein, though it could be uh, the RNA goes and does something directly rather than being messenger. So there, there are various things that could happen. Uh, but the definition of a perturbed or altered state uh, is a, sub, a perturbed substate relative to a reference mechanism um, such as a single DNA base difference, a single nucleotide polymorphism relative to some reference genome. The shape of this, you will draw this with a drawing program we're going to give you, uh, is a rectangular box. Um, and in the box there should be a text that identifies the type of perturbation from some standard or specified ontology. Um, and these substates are usually named with nouns. Now my role in this project is to be an ontologist, which I find quite amusing because I'm not doing deep metaphysics. In the bioinformatics world, ontology means designing a controlled vocabulary. So it's really so databases can talk to each other. I mean, there's often ontology in with databases, deciding the fields and the names of the fields. You're probably familiar with that kind of world. And there's now quite an industry in bioinformatics of designing ontologies. Uh, the gene ontology people have about 20 people at Stanford and they're producing daily more terminology connected with more of what genes do. Um, and so you, our goal is to have appropriate terms for, for the steps and the mechanisms so that drop-down boxes can be things that our expert could choose. We haven't worked all this out yet. The goal will be at each step you'll have some options to choose from but if you as the expert want a term that we don't have, we think something's happening there, but we didn't think about it and put it in our, our list so far, uh, you can tell us and we'll decide if we want to include your term in the, in the next iteration. Um, so the mechanism module, which is going to connect the states, here's the definition. A producer of change, a specific productive activity, a module of entities and activities that produce the next substate. Um, so, example, protein synthesis with all its component entities and activities could be just a module you put there because we know how that one works. Uh, or you could be talking about the altered activity of a protein. 
or the altered activities of various cell components, such as autophagy, uh, or altered activities in the immune system. So there'll be various kinds of alterations in states that we can conjecture are the next step in, in the chain. You represent this with an oval link, providing a label of a link. So those of you who are enamored of causal graphs, I'm telling you, you need to label your links and not just have a line and say cause. Um, and uh, this oval text indicates a specific or type of productive activity. Uh, it could be unique. You could find a new one, but it's probably a type that we already know, and maybe we've given you an appropriate name for it. Um, and these are usually named with verbs. So this is coming directly out of our mechanism view of entities and activities, nouns and verbs. Um, and this is what it's going to look like. SNP, mechanism module, altered state, mechanism module, end state. We're building this up. Is anybody with us? Anybody awake? <laughs> um, these, these, these are my teaching techniques late in the afternoon. Um, so, in addition to conjecturing the disease mechanism, we also want you, as our expert, to think about some place along this chain where a therapeutic intervention might be used. So we're attempting to help you discover a drug or some other kind of therapeutic intervention. Um, and this would be a site, one of the things in your mechanism chain, uh, where you think therapy could be directed, um, and you want to name the d disease site um, as th th this. The nature of the disease mechanism is, is the site. Sorry, I, I didn't make that point clear. Let me start over. The nature of the disease mechanism site can aid the design of a therapy at that site. We're not going to go quite that far in our project, but we just want to identify the places and the, maybe the structure of the protein or something where therapy could be designed. And this is going to be represented by an octagon. And your, the goal of whatever you think could be happening in that octagon, which will be pretty opaque at, at this point in early stage, will be um, uh, to restore normal or to alleviate some symptom of the disease or maybe something else. I mean, therapies can take various forms. So this is now, we're building up the kind of representation that we want for this mechanism chain. This is what we had before. We had a SNP, a protein synthesis, we got an altered protein. Now that might be where you think you could direct therapy. And this, of course, is exactly what's happening in cystic fibrosis. They know the gene. They know uh, the the for the most common defect in Americans, Caucasian Americans that have cystic fibrosis, they know exactly the shape of the altered protein. And one of the recent therapies is to put in a chaperonin protein to help that reform so it can go and carry out what it does, which is transporting chloride across an ion. Um, now with Crohn's disease, uh, we know something about some of the proteins that we think are involved. And we have a wet lab associated with us that can actually test some of the hypotheses, which is a great addition to a, a high com computational project. Um, and, <coughs> and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. But also, uh, there are things from the environment that are getting in the gut all the time. And there are things in, that live in the gut that are not human DNA. <laughs> So the microbiome, as it's now called, uh, is very important in the intestines. Uh, and some of the bacteria there are good bugs. Some of them are bad bugs. And they're just beginning to try to figure that one out. But we wanted to show that our representation of mechanism chains can allow influences from the environment to come in at some appropriate stage. And so if if you, as our expert or microbiome person, and you happen to know uh, which, which are bad bacteria they're going to eat up the gut wall, you can bring that, represent that right here now. Uh, right now, it's a big black box in the literature. Uh, and then a disease symptom is, is what's coming at the end. Now, this is how far my collaborators have gotten on one mechanism chain they've published, and some of these alternative branches are from their competitors, actually. Uh, but they, this John Mulk is the computational biologist I'm working with at the University of Maryland. Um, and he and his lab, before I joined them, had already been investigating this MST uh, gene 
and mutants in it that alter the MST protein, and they found uh, with um, they know the structure of that protein, and they know ways uh, that it's altered by the particular uh, mutation they're looking at, and it gives a lower amount of a complex that it forms with another protein. Another group thinks it happens a different way. We think there are a lot of black boxes in their discussion so far. Um, and we're going to have drop-down boxes where references to literature are placed. So their um, PubMed IDs are ways that literature in biomedicine in the United States can identify a given article which is a claiming some result from, from usually uh, either clinical or wet lab work. And so we want, each, ideally, each of the steps in the mechanism, we tell our students and we send them off to go search the literature, uh, to have a backup of research that has been done to support the claim that this is this gene affects this alteration or you know if there you have less of this complex then that will happen etc now you can see and this is a different way we're talking about integration Carl Kramer and I talked a lot about integration of various sorts and mechanisms but this is a new one where we're talking about integrating from the point of view of different stages going from DNA to protein, maybe to protein, depending on what the RNA does, um, to some complexes of proteins. And then after that, there's a lot of open-ended what's, what's happening at the cellular level, at the tissue level, at the organism level, in order to get the particular disease symptoms. And this part of disease mechanisms, even for even for cystic fibrosis, which is one of the most studied and best understood monogenic diseases in the United States, this part of the mechanism for that disease is not well understood, getting from the default, the, the defect in the protein to the actual disease symptoms and why the severity differs and so on. So this is often the really hard part of disease mechanism chains, getting from something molecular that we understand to telescoping it to cells or tissues or a whole organism phenotype information. But that's our goal. All right, so um, there are various heuristics for mechanism discovery I tried to summarize for this group today. So this is a, a, a raw new list. See what you think. Um, my thesis, the product shapes the process. And characterization of mechanisms and mechanism features to be found can aid can, can aid discovery, and that's what the, most of the talk has been about. I think sketch to schema is a very an abstract and very general idea that if the goal is to discover mechanisms, <coughs> um, drawing a sketch and pointing to black and gray boxes that need to be filled is a problem finding and a problem solving aiding stru uh, structure uh, that I personally have found a, a rather powerful um, thing to do. Uh, diagrammatic representation is rampant in molecular biology and neurobiology, the two domains we've worked in primarily. Um, it's, it, things are very visualizable. We can draw the schemas. The schemas are drawn in in papers, they're drawn in textbooks, um, and so it, not not all mechanisms have this kind of representation. The ones we have been looking at do, and it's very powerful. And that was a point made uh, the other day about the role diagrams can play. We can now talk about we've got a limited kind of mechanism we're looking at, and we can say the overall organization of this kind of mechanism from gene to phenotype is in fact a beginning to ending kind of mechanism. I know some mechanisms don't have this kind of linear nature, but gene to phenotype to some extent does. Of course, there are transcription factors, things get turned on and off, there are various kinds of cycles at various points, uh, but we really are trying to go from, from gene to phenotype. Um, and I've been trying to convince my collaborators then in addition to the forward chaining that they're, they were always they're doing, and that's how they think about it, they start with the gene, they get to the protein, they try to figure out what comes next, I've been trying to say, couldn't we go backwards also? Couldn't we start with some of the disease symptoms or groups of disease symptoms with the immune system ones and the gut wall systems, and then see if we can group the genes and come back from the other end? 
they don't think that way. And this is a heuristic, of course, that from, comes from artificial intelligence. Uh, and I'm trying to see if I can bring this heuristic into to our lab group. I have to tell you, I haven't had much success so far. But it seems to me a powerful thing to try to work from both ends. That's what happened with protein synthesis. Molecular biologists were going this way. The biochemists were coming this way. Zemechnik, one of the major discoverers, said it was like we were digging from two sides of a tunnel and we met in the middle and figured out what the RNAs did. Um, partly from Watson work walking over to a lab in Boston and saying, oh, Crick already thought of that. So anyway, there are various ways that middles get found. Um, but I, I think this is a very powerful heuristic, working from both ends when you can. Uh, so knowing overall organization, putting together modules, forward and backward chaining are all strategies that we talk about in the chapter in the book uh, and that I'm trying to make use of here uh, in talking about general heuristics for mechanism discovery. Now we are working on developing a library of types of entities, types of activities, types of altered states, types of mechanism modules for the various stages we've broken it into and hope to have those as sort of biologically informed aids for our discoverers so there'll be a pull down menu. Maybe they can find the one they need. Maybe they can't, they might have to make up a new one. Uh, but that, the goal is to have a biologically informed digital representation system to aid human experts in discovering mechanisms. Um, and again, this is an idea that, that comes from artificial intelligence. You have a library of things you need kind of know what you need, you go to that library, you see if you can get it, you can plug it in. It's modular subassembly is one of the more creative things AI systems can do, uh, in my experience. Okay, so, for, in conclusion, product shapes the process of discovery. I've characterized mechanisms for you, talked about sketches to schemas, talked about normal mechanisms, uh, talked about disease mechanisms, the representation that we're working on, and briefly, some heuristics for mechanism chain discovery. I'm sure there's more to say about that. Uh, in the keeping with the scientific tradition, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, Peter Mockamer and Carl Craver at the Pittsburgh Center for Philosophy of Science, where this work got going, support from the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and now at the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research at the University of Maryland out in Shady Grove, a separate campus from our College Park campus and John Maltz Computational Biology Lab that I'm now a part of, and the folks that are in that lab. Um, and here are some selected references. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay then, well we've got 30 minutes for questions. But could you please keep your questions short and not too long discourses? And I'm supposed to repeat the key idea a, to see if I understand it, and B, for the taping that's going on here. Very short question. Very short, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is a gene? <coughs> Ideally, for us, it's a segment of DNA that codes for a protein. What about the, the young people who know this and say that it's biting? Well, it, we, we often can trace the messenger RNAs with the chip we're looking at, so we can see it either, either at a pre-splice state or an after-splice state. If, if you, we, for the particular one we're working on, it's after-splice, and we've got the complete sequence of the protein, and we know the three-dimensional structure of the protein. But ours is a very simple case. And of that hundred, goodness knows, and all of those are complications, as, as we're sadly very much aware. We have one million proteins, and no more than 30,000 genes, whatever they mean. Uh, well, you can, you can go backwards or forwards uh, in whichever way you want to reason about what mutants have done, either to the DNA or to the pro protein of interest. Okay, Michaela and David. Sure. <laughs> I, I love the talk. I think it was a terrific talk, and it kind of shows all the good that comes from doing philosophy of science on kind of cutting edge topics. I guess my question is about uh, the extension of uh, the literature on mechanisms to uh, discovery of, um, of, of disease, what you were proposing yesterday, which is something you have not seen this before, I haven't mean, kind of kept up 
Wikipedia. It's not published. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So it's not like I missed one of the references. Um, and what I was thinking is, it would be amazing, I mean, you know, if, if you, your team, were able to come up with a sort of mechanism, templates for cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, Crohn's disease, and um, I wonder about the sort of philosophical challenges that immediately come to mind. As my understanding was that the traditional definition of what a mechanism is, entities and activities, is very much localized, it's very much idiosyncratic, the specific phenomenon, very well circumscribed. And here what we're trying to do is to go all the way up the levels of biological organization from genes to cells to tissues to organs. And, and so it's that kind of vertical movement of the mechanism, which has always thought it was kind of horizontal. You're kind of looking at, I don't know, the neural reaction of I don't know, these neurons with these other neurons, some synaptic reactions. I, I, was, I was wondering the kind of challenges that that raises or, but from a biological point of view, you know, the whole anti-reductionist literature, you kind of explain changes at the, kind of the tissue in terms of changes at the level of all the way down. But it seems, if I understood correctly, the spirit here is the idea that, no, you, as you were saying, you're trying to go from uh, Well, here's the, the, here's the diagram yeah. going from the gene to the phenotype. And I'm drawing it differently than Carl Craver's diagram, if that's what you had in mind with his circles of, of uh, hierarchically organized levels. So the, for, the, for the camera, the question is, for the mecha mechanisms, it's easy to say if we're just doing gene to protein, but what about trying to include cells and tissues and organs and how is all of this going to be integrated? And we've really worked hard on this um, because our idea is to telescope it at the cellular level, at the tissue level, to the organism phenotype level, unless we need to expand it to understand the, the, what's molecularly happening between, say, two cells or something. So this is a telescope diagram. Craver's diagrams with the circles hierarchically never went from beginning to end at each of the levels. Um, and, and that, of course, you have, if, if you're going to do it that way, you have to do it that Well, you can't actually, for gene to phenotype, do it that way, because you've got to start with DNA, which is a molecule, and you need to end with organismal phenotype, uh, which is not true for some of the brain stuff he's, he has done. So this is a different, a different way of representing relationships between what we're calling stages, and in any given stage, we're, we're, the goal is to uh, represent what, what I'm calling the operative components. In earlier published work, I call them the working entities. Bechtel calls them the working components. So you see, up here we don't have fundamental particles. I haven't actually even shown you an electron, uh, which of course is in all these molecules. What I've done is represent the state of the, of the, of the entity or the activity at the ones that are working in this mechanism. Um, and so for a given phenomenon and in a given field, a given problem set, you may want to do it and, and it in a different way. Uh, but we're trying to find if it's cell-cell signaling, then, then we can just do it in terms of one cell, a signal, and another cell. And we don't have to do it all the way down to some the molecular details unless we need it, unless we need it for the therapeutic design or something. So we're trying to figure out for each of these stages what are the working components, the operative uh, entities and activities that are most perspicuously represented for human understanding of what's happening at each of these stages? But they're telescoped, and that's the language we're using with the idea, maybe we know, maybe we don't know how to blow it up, uh, or if in some cases, you know, maybe you could collapse it more for the purposes at hand. So we're tr we, we know that that whole issue is there, uh, but I've had an, an idea about working entities in genetics that I've tried to use in talking in, about integration rather than reduction. Um, and so if you want to know the working entities of Mendel's laws, it's the chromosomes, it's not the genes. And going down to the genes doesn't give you any explanation. Going to DNA gives you no explanation of segregation and independent assortment and linkage for Mendelian genetics. So I've been arguing the, uh, this idea of find the operative entities for that part of the mechanism in other work, and I'm trying to use it in this work. <laughs>
but it's it is a it is a problem. Um, I think this actually follows on from Michaela's question. Uh, in terms of thinking about the, the representation, I mean, I, I really like this. I think it's a great project. I'm really happy that you guys are doing this. Um, and, and I agree with you that sometimes uh, edges should be labeled. Um, <laughs> but, but the question is, is, about, uh, is about, I mean, there are known cases where, for example, it's a, we can say within the cell, here's what happens that messes up the protein in some way. But then the phenotypic effect is something much more about concentration, right? Across this region, it doesn't actually matter that this cell was messed up. What matters is that in aggregate, something went wrong. So I'm just trying to think representationally. That's no longer a chain. It's a bunch of little chains yeah. inside a bigger chain. Is that, and so well, we're, we're, we're going to try to do that in terms of one of our boxes. Um, or, well, some, there, there's already, there are already things on here that has to have to do with how many of thing, the things there are that are interacting at a certain point. Um, and so the goal is to try to represent that in one of our boxes or ovals or set of them um, and then see what's coming into it and what's going out of it. Uh, and then you can have a population of things going on in, in that altered state representation. So, yeah, we, we, we know we're going to have to deal with concentrations and rates, um, and, and we hope we're going to be able to use this as a general way of representing uh, more complex things than just single molecules or molecule-molecule interaction. Sorry, I'm not doing a good job of repeating questions. Uh, well, don't worry about it. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more question. I guess. Me? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, this is all very interesting and probably mm -hmm. very useful also for scientific practice. I just wonder about the generalizability of this account, say the cross disciplines, and uh, let me just make a couple of observations from the point of view of economics that I know best. Regarding this mechanism chain diagram, it seems to me that uh, you can't really draw such a diagram as ante. In what? I'm ex sorry. Ante, but, but maybe ex post. And, and the reason. I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite understand what you said. Well, so Before. prior to this chain actually taking place in, 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 in the real world economy, it's where you can't draw. And that's because there is too much contingency there regarding which mechanisms are triggered in which order, etc. for there to be oh, a the problem of predictability if it hasn't occurred yet. For there to be a regularity that you could sort of uh, write down. So, uh, so is, is, there regular, is there phenomena that you're trying to explain? Phenomena so we're so using in the Bogan and Woodward sense where you've already got something regularly occurring. For instance, the collapse of the global financial system. You know, you can't, How often you does can't this happen? <laughs> exposed, exposed you can. Then you can trace the focus events, etc. But, but prior to this. Oh, yes. So the, the, pro the problem of being able to use this for prediction into the future. Um, right. is certainly a right. problem is. when you don't have repeatable phenomena. With diseases, we hope we do. Some diseases are more, re exactly. more similar in, um, from patient to patient than others, of course. Uh, but yeah, we run into the same problem when we're doing um, uh, evolutionary mechanisms. Uh, we can do it post, we can do it afterwards. You know, the drought hit Daphne Major, and this is, this is the beak of the finch that got selected for. But uh, we might, even though we knew the weather conditions and we knew the variation among the beaks, we probably couldn't have predicted which ones uh, would have been selected for in that case. So discussion of specific evolutionary chains often have exactly that same character. Uh, and the historical sciences do present interesting problems that the experimental sciences with a lot of repeatable phenomena uh, don't and they, there's a real question how much of a different kind of methodology you need for change that happened once um, and that's that's a that's a big discussion in the mechanism literature as you may know there's another observation if I may very briefly and that has to do with the very concept of mechanism if you if you if you consider say these spatial features and temporal features etc that you listed as necessary. Excuse me just a second. I'm having, uh, Lorenzo, I'm having trouble hearing him. So if oh. you all could take your conversation outside, that would be helpful. Yeah, go ahead. I, yeah. I'm playing my teacher okay. role. So here. the very concept of mechanism, you, you listed 
You want to talk to me about the concept of mechanism? Go ahead. Right. You listed these temporal and <laughs> spatial features. Yes. Uh, as sort of necessary ingredients in, 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 in the notion of mechanism. But again, looking at how economists use this term, mechanism, and they, they talk a lot about it, and there are lots of models about different kinds of economic mechanisms. Uh, there are no such spatial features at all, and uh, much of the time they, they, they have no temporal features. Really? They don't have temporal ones? I mean, those, those, those equilibrium mechanisms that they are so fond of, I mean, there is no time at all. Okay, um, well we find it interesting, we, we, our claim was we were doing it from molecular biology and neurobiology and we've been gradually extending it to other biological areas and it's really quite fascinating when, when people in other disciplines try to characterize mechanisms, the term is often used in other disciplines, how much of the features we've found for the biological ones apply or don't. So that will be an interesting cross-disciplinary discussion uh, and you could say this is much too specific for those kinds of mechanisms, but perhaps they have other features that we're not seeing in these molecular biological ones. Thank you. Sorry, Sorry, that's, that's all we've got time for.